to see you all. We'll go ahead and start with Refuge in Bodhicitta. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Just letting that connect for a moment. Okay. So we're on chapter three, which is all about Manjushri. So if you haven't read chapter three, that is your mission for the week, should you choose to accept it. The Manjushri chapter doesn't have a ton about the specifics of the mantra, so I've drawn on other sources to help us unpack that. It has a lot about the symbolism and a little bit about the seven wisdoms, but uh, Manjushri is not getting quite as much um, about the specifics of the deity in this chapter. It's getting more about kind of different historical figures and subsequent Buddhas who were emanations of or disciples of Manjushri. And there's some really cool, inspiring stories about those guys in the chapter, which you guys might find interesting. So I definitely recommend reading it. It'll have some some bits that maybe um, you haven't come across before. But um, before we kind of uh, I guess, get into the practice section, I thought I would just do the very, you know, cursory, like, who is Manjushri? What's the deal with his mantra? And then we could get into some practice and some Q&A about it. This session, I was thinking we could also talk a little bit about the four Buddha bodies, if that's something that interests you. And um, if it's only half the group, the notes are in (laughs) the PowerPoint and you can read them later. Um, But it looks like there's some interest. Yeah. Okay. We'll do some four Buddha bodies talking as well. Right. Here we go. So this bit is from the book. And what does Manjushri mean? So Manjushri is the Sanskrit and Jamyang or Jampelyang is the Tibetan. So the first part of the name Manju or Jam in Tibetan means soft. And this is in the sense of pacified, not in the sense of like complacent or in the sense of weak, but in the sense of gentle and subdued. So then we have Shri or Pel in Tibetan, which means glorified. So Manju Shri is the soft glorified one. What does that mean? Manjushri's holy body has become soft or pacified by having eliminated all delusions, both the disturbing thought obscurations that block liberation and the subtle obscurations to knowledge that block full enlightenment. So this kind of twofold elimination is something that we really want to think about strategically, because if we were to realize emptiness directly and progress in that way, it's not enough, though incredibly profound. What we want is full omniscience. So we need to remove the subtle obscurations to knowledge as well. And those are those imprints left from negative karma, even after it's been purified. So a great deal of merit is required on this path if we're seeking full enlightenment, not just quote, mere nirvana. So what are these subtle defilements? They are the subtle negative imprints left on the mental continuum by the concept of inherent existence. That's the innate ignorance we were talking about last week. So this concept is something we sentient beings hold until we become enlightened. When we become an Arya being and are in meditative equipoise, single-pointedly concentrating on emptiness, these obscurations are not manifest, but when we arise from meditation, the dual view naturally reasserts itself. As an Arya being, we have achieved nirvana, but we still are blocked from full enlightenment by those subtle obscurations. Therefore, we need to combine the wisdom side that realizes emptiness with the method side of bodhicitta and enter the Mahayana, and then work through the six perfections of a bodhisattva and achieve full enlightenment. 
So whenever you see this word aria, here, someone who has realized emptiness directly, perceptually. And in this context, we're talking about someone who actually has seen emptiness, but only while they're in meditation. This mere vacuity, this non-affirming no negation, if it has some sort of visual impression, it's a subtle autumn dawn, kind of a bluish situation, but don't get lost in form. And they are aware of that spacious, infinite possibility just in meditation directly. Then when they're out of meditation, life looks the way it's always looked, but the spell has been broken a bit. So you're not believing the same appearances that you always believed. So we talked a little bit about this last week, but just to kind of clarify. So it's only when we've eliminated all the subtle obscurations we will become fully enlightenment, fully enlightened, excuse me, which is what the second part of Manjushri's name, Sri or Pell, glorified, refers to. So therefore, Manjushri and Jamyang refers to the holy mind that is free of all mistakes of the mind and all the defilements and has completed all the realizations. So just looking at the iconography, the iconography is that Manjushri is the embodiment of the enlightened wisdom of all the Buddhas, realizing the ultimate nature of reality. So, you know, there's Manjushri, like Manjushris, plural, right? Like people who have manifested these qualities or the historical figure or the folk story or the person who is showing up in some of the sutras. But when we're talking about the archetypal energy, it's like all of the wisdom of all of the Buddhas takes this form. So his left hand holds the stem of a lotus flower, which supports the perfection of wisdom sutra, which is an important text, which reveals this method for developing insight and realizing wisdom. His right hand um, holds like a flaming sword symbolizing the power of wisdom to cut through ignorance, the root of all suffering. So when we see the sword, um, it's said to be made of something called sky metal, but really what we're looking at is not a weapon to harm sentient beings, it's a weapon to cut through ignorance. So um, some of these kind of like violent looking deities can be quite confusing for us, but if we remember in Buddhism, the enemy is negative states of mind. The enemy is not other sentient beings. So then we have this concept of Manjushri's direct disciples and or emanations. Are they disciples or are they emanations? Who can say? Um, but in the chapter, they talk about three main ones, which are Shantideva and Sakya Pandita and Lama Tsongkhapa. So Shanti Deva is very famous for Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, and Lama Tsongkhapa is very famous for writing the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, whose maybe less well-known is Sakya Pandita. So Sakya Pandita was the one who um, kind of formalized or clarified that teaching on parting from the four clingings. So this is from the text. It says, before Sakya Pandita was able to do the retreat his guru advised him to do, there were some hindrances. However, after six months, during a meditation session, he saw Manjushri sitting in front of him on a throne with two bodhisattvas beside him. Then with his holy mouth, Manjushri gave him this short teaching on the four clingings. If you cling to this life, you are not a Dharma practitioner. If you cling to the three realms of samsara, that is not renunciation. If you cling to cherishing the self, that is not bodhicitta. If you cling to the self as truly existing, that is not the right view. So because Sakya Pandita realized that the importance of all the Buddhist teachings was contained in this advice, he kept it in his heart, meditating on it and putting it into practice. And then of course went on to teach it to others. So we, we get a lot of these stories, don't we, where there's someone who was working really hard on their practice and was seeking some kind of inspiration and they're meditating and meditating and nothing. Yeah, bubkis, right? Just nothing. And there, you know, you'll find um, in a lot of the stories, like one of my favorites is a Sangha, where he um, was praying to see Manjushri, or no, excuse me, he was praying to see Maitreya. 
And um, every, you know, three or six years, he'd go down the hill to the village kind of discouraged. And then something in the village would kind of make him think twice and go back to his meditation and keep on going. And this would happen several times. And eventually he was just over it. And he's like, I've been meditating for decades. This is too much. I'm not getting anywhere. But he saw... um, a dog who'd been hit by a cart and the dog had an open wound and the wound was festering with maggots. And because Sangha had meditated so deeply on loving kindness and compassion without any concern, without any repulsion, without any worries for himself, he just knelt down to try and help the dog. But then he saw the maggots and he didn't want to hurt the maggots either. So he used his tongue to get the maggots out of the open wound, the open festering wound of the dog, so that neither maggots nor dog were harmed. So like that would gross us out. Yes. (laughs) Right. Like who's with me? That would be gross. But he had done such amazing meditation on loving kindness that that didn't even cross his mind. And so as he stuck his little tongue out to go for the first maggot to gently remove it from the wound, the dog turned into Maitreya, who had been there the whole time, who then went on to tell him he'd been there the whole time and that he'd seen all of the things he was getting up to in his meditation session, including like blowing his nose into the wind. And then the like boogers would go and like hit Maitreya's robe. And he's like, look, all the boogers on my robe. That's from you. You did that, right? (laughs) So, I mean, these kind of stories crack us up, right? There's so Tibetan, these stories. But I think it helps us understand that the Buddhas are constantly there. The work is worthwhile. But if we're like banking on some sort of magical appearance, that's the last thing that's going to happen. Yeah, if we're full of expectations and pressure and like needing some sort of display, That's the very thing that's going to make us miss the point. But Asanga had done all of these amazing meditations on loving kindness. He really did put the work in and he was clearing eons of obscurations with those and eventually was able to see that Maitreya had been there the whole time. So these stories, the question is, was Asanga already the Buddha pretending to be a regular person to teach us something? Or was he a regular person and Maitreya came to inspire him and that whole scene was to teach us something? Or does it matter, right? It doesn't matter. There's stories to uplift and inspire us. What we wanna hear is what's gonna be the story of our own practice. So when you're hearing someone is an emanation of this Buddha or an emanation of that Buddha, it could be they are in fact, a supreme nirmanakaya form of that archetypal energy, or it could be they're just someone who has kind of practice in alignment with that style of practice, or it could be someone who's very deeply inspired by that deity. And again, we cannot take someone else's measure. Yeah, this is the thing we have to keep coming back to is that we have no idea who anyone is right? The kindest, sweetest person in our life who's inspiring and supportive and the best friend on earth might just be a nice, regular person. And the person who is awful to us and who berates us and criticizes us and betrays us might be a Buddha manifesting. We have no idea. Or vice versa, right? Like, we don't know. Why do we not know? Karmic obscurations. So what we do is we talk in terms of behavior, Because we can't talk in terms of people. That's a bad person. That's a good person. We have no idea. Is it even a person, (laughs) right? Who knows? But we can say this behavior is discordant with ethics. Therefore, for the health of the community, we address that negative behavior to help the community. This behavior is positive and conducive. We support and uplift it and encourage it. So we look in terms of behavior when we're looking outward but we also wanna look in terms of behavior when we're looking at ourselves. Because if we too much identify with all of the mistakes and all of the successes, we're falling into the same old trap of over-identification. So when you're reading about these different teachers and scholars and who's an emanation of this or a disciple of that, don't get too tight about it, yeah? Try and get the pith, get the essence of what the point of the story is. The point of the story is to practice with an open heart without expectations. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so a little bit about Buddha bodies, but um, interrupt if you get lost. 
So this excerpt is from a really excellent book by His Holiness, I think you guys would love. Um, it's called Opening the Eye of New Awareness. It's an old one. It's been around for eons, right? Now it's been around for, I don't know, a couple decades. It's great. Um, it, he says, in dependence upon the paths of sutra and mantra, mentioned previously in the book, bodhisattvas attain the result in four bodies of a Buddha. So the nature body, which is the Swavavakakaya, the wisdom truth body, the Jhana Dharmakaya, the enjoyment body, the Sambhogakaya, and an emanation body, the Nirmanakaya. So from the superior Maitreya's ornament for clear realization, this is a text that you might study if you do some of the basic program or the master's program. Maitreya says, the nature, complete enjoyment, and likewise emanation and truth, as well as activities are expressed as four aspects of Buddha bodies. So we don't wanna be thinking too um, concretely when you hear the word body. So kaya and body, these are synonymous, right? A kaya is a body. But what we're talking about is a collection of qualities, a body of qualities or a kaya of qualities. And so all enlightened beings have these four aspects to them. So this is where we get stuck with, are we a Buddha already or not? And the answer is sort of, right? The answer is sort of. So if you look at this chart, this is your mind, okay? This is your mind. Your mind has impermanent changing aspects and permanent not changing aspects. So permanent doesn't necessarily mean eternal. Permanent means static. Impermanent doesn't necessarily mean ends. Impermanent just means changes moment to moment. So I think most of you know that, but just so we're not falling into old kind of colloquial definitions of those two terms. So dropping down underneath impermanent, it says the developmental lineage. And this is um, sometimes called the adventitious purity, right? Or that purity, which is to be developed. And there's a number of translations for that, but it's basically the work you need to do on your mind in order for it to become a Buddha mind or a Buddha body. And then the permanent one has the naturally abiding lineage or the um, natural purity. And this permanent side, going all the way down to that nature truth body, the Swavavakakaya, that's what's already here. That you don't have to do anything. That's the part of your Buddha nature that already exists effortlessly. And that's the fact of your mind being empty of inherent existence. Then the wisdom truth body, that Dhar Jhana Dharmakaya, is the result of realizing the mind is empty of inherent existence. So that's the result of the wisdom collection, the wisdom merit, right? That basket of um, accumulations, that's where the wisdom truth body comes from. And so then if we're looking at the emanation body and the enjoyment body, the Nimanakaya or the Sambhogakaya, when we're looking at Buddhist art, an emanation body is usually going to take the form of someone who is not a human color, who is maybe got extra arms, maybe got extra eyes, usually has some sort of crown situation happening, but not always. An emanation body is gonna be re represented that way. And an enjoyment body may or may not be represented that way. They might be represented as more of like a, a monk or a monastic type figure, um, maybe wearing robes. So there's a little bit of variation in the iconography, but what we're talking about is who can see what? So theoretically, we need all of these four bodies. The wisdom bodies are for ourself to relieve our own suffering. And then the form, quote, form bodies are to benefit others. The form bodies to benefit others, emanation body and enjoyment body, are the result of the merit side of the path. The compassion, bodhicitta, patience, etc. those collections related to relative truth, that the result of practicing that part of the path comes into play with the emanation and enjoyment bodies. Okay, so many words here. Um, we don't need to read all of the words here, but it might be useful. This is again from opening the eye of new awareness. Hang in there. If it's a lot, um, you can come back to it. But His Holiness says, 
through the Vajra-like or diamond-like meditative stabilization at the end of the continuum of the 10 grounds. The 10 grounds refers to the sections during the path of meditation on that fourth path that we talked about last week. Bodhisattvas exhaustively abandon the obscurations to omniscience, sometimes called knowledge obscurations. When the path of release induced by that uninterrupted path is attained, bodhisattvas attain the nature body, which is the state of having abandoned all adventitious defilements, the obscurations to liberation and the obscurations to omniscience. This is a factor of purity from adventitious defilements. Also, the emptiness of true existence of the mind that previously, during the ordinary state, was posited as the naturally abiding lineage, providing the capacity to develop into Buddhahood, becomes fully transformed. At that point, it becomes the emptiness of the omniscient mind of a Buddha. It is a factor of natural purity. The truth body endowed with these two purities, purity from adventitious defilements and natural purity, is the nature truth body. Although it occurs only when Buddhahood is attained, it is not impermanent, it is not constructed through causes and conditions. It has a nature of permanence that is not changing into something of another nature. So it's kind of like resting there in a kind of latent state, even though it's your naturally abiding purity. It's only when the other side of it comes that they're both kind of fully active, for lack of a better word. So those two truth bodies and the form bodies, they're all arising simultaneously but you're working on them in the beginning as separate projects. So then the wisdom truth body or the jhana dharmakaya, this is the dharmakaya that you're probably the most used to hearing about. So this is a wisdom truth body is the exalted omniscient wisdom that directly perceives all modes and varieties of objects of knowledge as if they were in front of oneself. When it's divided in terms of conceptual isolates, there are 21 categories of uncontaminated exalted wisdom, ranging from the 37 harmonies with enlightenment through to the exalted knowledge of all aspects. These will become clear in the explanation of the mental qualities of a Buddha below in the book, and the nature and wisdom truth bodies are directly perceivable only by Buddhas. Okay, so we're just talking about the first two, okay? And so if you really love this topic, study grounds and paths. Okay, <laughs> Grounds and Paths or Salam. Um, the book by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Venerable Tubtin Chudrin related to this is the Samsara, Nirvana, and Buddha Nature one. I think it's like book number three in that Wisdom and Compassion series. So it's really brilliant and really clear if you kind of want to do a bit more in depth, but not so in depth that that's the main thing you're studying for weeks and weeks. Yeah, so when we're talking about the wisdom bodies, to make it very simple, wisdom bodies are the result of realizing emptiness and the fact of the mind being empty. The wisdom side, okay? So it's related to practices to do with ultimate truth. Whenever you hear ultimate truth, think lack of inherent existence. What are ultimate truths? The fact that things are empty. Yeah, what is my ultimate truth? Yunten lacking inherent existence. What is the cup's ultimate truth? The cup lacking inherent existence. Okay, so it's the same emptiness, but what it's attributed to is different. What it's attributed to is a relative truth. Cup is a relative truth, Yunten's a relative truth. You with me? Ish. Yeah, okay. So far, so good. <laughs> All right. Gently, gently. So why do you need wisdom bodies? Because you need to not suffer. Okay. So the, what happens with the wisdom bodies is that only Buddhas see other wisdom bodies, see, loosely said, yeah, see. So if you only had wisdom bodies, you would be of no use to anyone except yourself, but at least you'd be out of suffering, right? So we need form bodies for the sake of others. Form bodies are re the result of practicing related to relative truth. So whenever you hear relative truth or conventional truth, those are synonymous, you need to think deceptive. Yeah, all relative truths are deceptive. What's the deception? They appear to be 
inherently existent when in fact they're empty of inherent existence. Yeah, which doesn't mean they don't exist at all. Okay, relative truths do exist. They just don't exist inherently. So it just takes a lot of sitting to be like, what does that mean? What does that even mean, right? And there's all sorts of analogies. Sometimes the lamas will say, imagine, you know, you're looking at a white snow mountain and you put on sunglasses and it looks blue, right? It really does look blue, <laughs> right? From our perspective, things really do seem inherently existent. And then if you were to realize emptiness, it'd be like taking off the sunglasses for a minute and being like, oh, Snow Mountain is actually white, right? So in meditative equipoise, it's you going, oh, it's actually empty of inherent existence, oh. And then you get out of meditative equipoise. It's like you put the sunglasses back on, the Snow Mountain's blue again, but you don't believe it, right? You're like, ha ha, looks blue, but I know it's white. Yeah, so that's how an Arya being is out of meditative equipoise, is that things still appear inherently existent, but the spell is broken. They don't buy into it. Someone appears inherently horrible, they do not become angry in response. They don't go, oh, that is a horrible person, and now I feel uncomfortable and grumpy about it. They don't buy into that same old trap. Okay, this is to really overly simplify it, but I think it can help to kind of frame it in that way. Have I lost anybody? Okay. Okay, we're going to do form bodies now. <laughs> okay. So complete enjoyment body, Sambhogakaya. So a complete enjoyment body is achieved through training in a pure land on the occasion of the paths of learners. It is the form body in which a bodhisattva initially becomes fully enlightened in a special place called a heavily adorned highest pure land. Having five certainties, it is the basis of emanation, of a supreme emanation body. Okay, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. What are these five certainties? Okay, if you've got an enjoyment body, you have a definite abode, so it dwells in a pure land. You have a body. The definite body is clearly and fully adorned with the 32 mar major marks and 80 minor marks of a Buddha. The definite retinue is you've got only bodhisattvas around. S common beings as well as hearers and solitary realizers can't meet you. They don't have the merit to meet you. The definite doctrine is that people in this realm or in this mental state teach only the Mahayana. And the time is that it dwells without displaying the aspects of birth or death until cyclic existence is emptied. So a form body that has all five certainties is an object within the sphere of activity of the great vehicle superiors, meaning bodhisattvas, who have directly perceived the truth, meaning ultimate truth. So therefore, such a form body is called an enjoyment body. That is, it's enjoyed or used by great vehicle superiors or aryas. So if you have a complete enjoyment body, that means bodhisattvas can see you, but no one else can see you. <laughs> right? You're only able to teach Arya bodhisattvas specifically. So bodhisattvas who have realized emptiness directly. And people at that level still need teachings. They still need support for practice. Um, one of the reasons why we're making lots of prayers to be reborn in a pure land is because then we're going to be in the most conducive state for learning and developing on the path. To be a human, again, is excellent. It's not the end of the world. We can do a huge amount as a human, particularly Tantra. But in a pure land, there's going to be a lot less distractions. Think of it as like heaven and a university and a Dharma center and a retreat space. Like a heavenly Dharma center, right? Okay. But, you know, in that state, the Buddhas aren't able to talk to sentient beings. So sentient beings with no realizations need an emanation body. So an emanation body is also a form body that can be met even by disciples who are common beings. It doesn't have those five certainties. So there's subdivisions, which I think helps clarify some of the things that we might get stuck on. So there's supreme emanation bodies, artisan emanation bodies, and birth emanation bodies. So a supreme emanation body must be identified as one emanated by a complete enjoyment body 
adorned with the major and minor marks, which brings about the welfare of disciples through 12 deeds in various world systems, such as Jampuvipa, this world. An example is Shakyamuni Buddha. So there's an emanation body, but then there's a supreme emanation body. Supreme emanation bodies are very rare for sentient beings to come into contact with. The most recent one was Shakyamuni Buddha. The next one that we'll be able to access as ordinary people will be Maitreya. But then you get artisan emanation bodies and birth emanation bodies, and these can manifest in any number of ways. Not, so I think this is where um, Buddhas are accessing us and connecting to us a lot more directly and regularly, is these birth emanation bodies and artisan emanation bodies. They might manifest as a doctor or a counselor or a teacher or a healer. They might manifest also as an inanimate object like a book or a holy object or they might abide in a holy object. It's tricky because we know that the mind of the Buddha pervades everywhere. There's nowhere in the universe there isn't also a Buddha's mind pervading, but the, and wherever the Buddha's mind is, so too is the Buddha's form. So that's true. And what are we able to engage with at our level, depending on our karma, is gonna be very variable. So it's going to be a rare case that we're actually in front of a Buddha who says, guess what, everyone, I'm a Buddha. And you're able to be like, yeah, I bet you are, <laughs> right? The last one was Shakyamuni Buddha. Yeah. There might be any number of human beings that we've even come into contact with that are in fact enlightened, but they're not what are called these supreme emanation bodies who have shown that like 12 deeds process, right? Like all of the prophecies, remember the Buddha story? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Anna, go ahead. And Lyonton, I hope this is not a rude question, but what about Rinpoche's? Are they supreme emanation bodies or are what are they? What are Rinpoche's? Yeah. Is that yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just always wondering. Yes. Well, the first answer is we cannot know. The second answer is people have told us that they are important. <laughs> okay, so the thing is, is that Rinpoche just means precious one. So it can be based on them being a tulku, a recognized reincarnate lama, which doesn't necessarily mean they're a Buddha. It just means that they were realized enough to choose their next rebirth and to send indications to their students. Hey, I'm going to be born here. Come and find me when I'm little so that I start my training right away. So they had enough realizations to intentionally be reborn somewhere and enough realizations and connections to their students to also say, come and find me. I'm sending you dreams until you come and get me. Yeah. And that's where you see the stories of like his holiness, the Dalai Lama. And when they're little, they show them the objects and they remember and that cool stuff. So in the case of his holiness, we assume he's enlightened. You know, it's a good assumption, but we can't ever say I know 100% for sure because we don't have clairvoyance. Seems true. There's also Rinpoche's who are Rinpoche's due to the work of this life. So anyone that's been the abbot of one of the great monasteries or one of the great tantra colleges later in life will get the title Rinpoche. So for example, my own teacher was just Geshe-la, like all of us have a Geshe-la, right? He was Geshe Teshi Sering in Australia at Chenrezig Institute. He was amazing, we loved him. And then His Holiness told him, uh, oi, go be <laughs> the Dean or you know the um, Vajra Master or the Lama Umze at Gyume Tantra College, which is a six year appointment. And after that six year appointment, now he's got an upgrade. upgrade. So he's Gyurme Kenser Geshe Teshi Sering. Yeah, Girme Kenser Rinpoche, Geshe Tashi Sering. So there are many Girme Kenser Rinpoche's, anyone who's been the abbot of Girme. And there's also Gyudo and et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes Rinpoche just means they were an abbot, which means the work they did in this life was profoundly significant. But who they were in their past lives, we have no idea. Now, the side note is that there's also Rinpoche's by design through kind of politics and money and, you know, dodginess and bureaucracy and nothing to do with his holiness per se. They're just, you know, someone recognized them who recognized them, who knows, they got attributed the name Rinpoche, but they're a charlatan. 
So that's why you don't want to just assume when you see a Rinpoche, that means it's a Buddha. You, it might be, it very well might be, but you want to still do your own checking. So that name comes about from many different places. Does that answer your question? Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Some teachers, lamas, I mean, for instance, Lama Yeshe, he was not called Rinpoche. Um, I don't know why, but um, so, you know, so the, the existence of a profound teacher might not be related with Absolutely. Yeah, there's many amazing teachers that have no titles whatsoever. And it, they don't have to be monks or nuns. They don't have to be Tibetan. They, you know, there's amazing teachers of all races, of all countries, of all genders, um, some recognized, some not recognized. And it's really the Tibetan tradition that puts all of this effort into recognizing teachers. Um, and I think in Bhutan and a little bit as well, and, you know, maybe Mongolia. But like when I'm in Taiwan, I was asking them, what do you guys do about your teachers when they die and like finding them and all of this? And they're like, if your karma with them is strong enough, you'll just keep bumping into them. Like, why force it? <laughs> like, they're a lot more low key about it. <laughs> you know, they're like, they'll find you, you'll find them. Karma is strong, make prayers for it. We don't have to go hunting for them. So they have a whole different approach to this whole tuku situation. But like Lama Yeshi, for example, his previous life, he was the abbess of a huge nunnery and much beloved by his nuns, her nuns at that point. And then he was reborn as Lama Yeshi and did all the amazing Lama Yeshi things. And now he's Osel and doing awesome documentary coolness and whatever Osel's up to. So, you know, this being is obviously got some cool stuff going on and has moved the minds of countless sentient beings, but he never got the title Rinpoche. Right. So I think maybe the question is more, who are the, all of those people in terms of the Buddha bodies? Well, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Some, some combination of, of that, I guess, right? Basically, we have all of them or none of them. Okay, so you either have all four Buddha bodies or you have no Buddha bodies except for the natural purity, which is ready, waiting to blossom. Okay, so it's not like it's a gradual thing. It's an all at once thing on that fifth path. Right. So you have path of accumulation, path of preparation, path of seeing, path of meditation, quite takes quite a long time, path of no more learning. Yeah. So path of no more learning is Buddhahood and you get all four Buddha bodies. But don't you have, don't yeah. you have impure, the impure Sambhavakaya and whatever before that? I mean, when you're a 10th level Bodhisattva, you are able to send out emanations. So before you're a Buddha, you just can't send out infinite em emanations until you're a Buddha. So definitely high level bodhisattvas are able to send emanations. That's definitely true. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it's, it can live in the realm of what do I do with this information? <laughs> what do I do with this information? Right. I need to go back to I need to practice related to relative truth. I need to practice related to ultimate truth. What are the practices related to the two truths, method and wisdom? What are the results of practicing method and wisdom? Form bodies, wisdom bodies. For the sake of others, for the sake of myself. So in terms of who we're engaging with, I think we can hear the Buddha through anyone if we're in the correct headspace, whether they're a Buddha or not. Yeah. And one of the useful things, I think, one of the, you know, countless useful things the Buddha said is that he will manifest as teachers with the 10 qualities. So if there's a teacher with the 10 qualities present, the Buddha is there trying to teach you. If that person with those 10 qualities is, is not enlightened, it doesn't really even matter. The Buddha is using them for you, especially if you're listening in that way. So um, in the Dropbox is the list of those 10 qualities, if you don't remember them off the top of your head. But um, it, it's interesting to think of, like, how is the Buddha trying to get to us mainly teaching? Yeah. And, and I've noticed this when I've been feeling like I really miss my own teacher. And there's lots of good Dharma teachers out there, but I don't really know who they are or what they are. And I don't have that deep connection necessarily. 
is that I imagine my own teacher at the crown of their head and them speaking through whoever it is I'm in front of. And then I bizarrely start to hear words that sound just like my teacher. It's cool, right? Um, this can also happen in a big public setting, say you're with his holiness and also like 3,000 of your closest friends. And you think, I really have a question for his holiness. I don't know that I'll get the opportunity, but you're there live in person. You think the question very strongly. Often he'll just answer it in the middle of the class. And you're like, thanks. <laughs> right. So the, the thing that we wanna do is to keep adopting the attitude that every single teaching is personal advice. It's personal advice. It's not just abstract general advice that's good for people to hear. It's for you specifically today in this moment then you will hear advice specifically for you today in this moment. Does it make sense? And then whoever's giving it is just the gateway or they're really a Buddha, who can say, doesn't even matter because you're inviting that collaboration of meeting of minds because the inner guru is just as important as the outer guru. So if the inner guru is listening, then it's able to engage with all the wisdom flooding you all the time. But if the inner guru is just kind of sleeping, Shakyamuni Buddha could be in front of you explaining perfectly, and you're just like, he seems nice, right? So, you know, we have to have that really engaged relationship with our practice, very much proactive, reaching back. Oh, that was such an amazing presentation of the four bodies. And um, it, and what, one thing I just found so amazing, I never... Like, I think I heard it, but it never quite registered that, you know, as you were saying, our own minds have this impermanent aspect and also this permanent aspect. Um, and so is the impermanent aspect the omniscient mind, which is always changing? And then the permanent aspect is the emptiness of that mind? When it's fully fledged, when you're a Buddha, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, like that. And um, there are yeah, details. That... You can say that generally. Yes. <laughs> I'm saying that. Any... <laughs> yeah, for, for a book. Yeah. My stuff, they'll be like, Yintin, that's not specific enough. But yes, generally, we can say that generally. Okay. And also, um, you know, this, like you were saying in the beginning, like how to understand the word Kaya. And I mm -hmm. think I'm still confused about that because. I think I just associate Kaya with like a body. And then when we were talking about um, the two bodies that are, that represent the mind of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, like, I just think like, is that's like mental consciousness. So I don't know yeah. why yeah. it's called like body. It's, it's a weird, it, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. And, you know, Kaya and body, you know, that's the best translation we could come up with. But you know how we say like a body of work, like someone's mm -hmm. body of work could be, you know, 20 volume texts. You know, it's not like it's um, it's a form necessarily. Their body of work were, was all the things that came out of their head and then wound up into a text, series of texts, their body of work. I don't know if it's a perfect analogy, but it sort of helps us understand the way in which body is used in this context. It's a collection. Yeah, so it's kind of like the mental momentum you gather through practicing wisdom results in collect in, results in wisdom bodies. You know, the mental momentum you create through your merit work results in form bodies, collections of then becoming abilities. I guess they started out as collections of merit; they become collections of abilities. But it's it's like you couldn't make a list of them because they're like infinite. Once you have omniscience, what can't you do? Yeah. You know, it's really only just based on the karma of sentient beings receptivity, but from your side, it's limitless. So it's like these collections. Yeah, that makes more, collections of ability. more easier. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like, it's just a collection of qualities, mental qualities. And how did there, you face like it? A, it's like there's a physical element, but it's so yeah. weird to talk in terms of form. Yeah. We get yeah. too materialistic about it. Yeah, but, um, and that's where the different tenant schools will have different discussions about what are the form bodies and how do the form bodies come about and can something immaterial become something material? And those questions are like a source of great debate, as you can imagine. 
ago. Yeah. But loosely speaking, we can say that once you achieve this level of omniscience, then you're able to manifest in whatever way sentient mm. beings need with precision, specifically according to their needs. You Thank know? you. That's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christine, go ahead. Oh, good evening, Vino Yantin. Um, how how does how do you find or what do you find is the most effective way to keep the inner guru engaged and and available f- so that we can receive as much as possible since yeah. it's always coming mm. you know what's your experience with that uh me personally um <laughs> coffee no I'm kidding um (laughs) look uh, you know I think that Lama Zopa Rinpoche is so good at explaining how we need more than mindfulness we need mindfulness plus we need bodhicitta mindfulness right and bodhicitta mindfulness I think is what keeps your inner guru awake and engaged because you're not just saying, oh, I'm sitting, oh, I'm sitting, I'm drinking water, I'm drinking water, I'm being present, I'm being present. That's all very useful for focus, but is it going to move you towards enlightenment really slowly, right? Yay, concentration, yay, not getting Alzheimer's, but, you know, like, let's lift our game a little bit. So bodhicitta mindfulness is mindfulness with the agenda of bodhicitta. So um, Rinpoche talks about this so beautifully in a number of books. It's worth Googling Bodhicitta Mindfulness Lama Zopa Rinpoche. But basically what you're doing is saying, the purpose of my life is to become enlightened. That's the point, right? Is to become enlightened for my sake, for others' sake, for the sake of all sentient beings, for the greater good, for the health of humanity, for the world. That is the purpose of my life. Now I'm making a cup of coffee, (laughs) right? So you're aware of making a cup of coffee, but you have the agenda of bodhicitta. What does that do? That makes you look at your habits and behaviors with the correct kind of scrutiny that says, do you know what? Two is enough for one day, right? (laughs) Without bodhicitta mindfulness, cup of coffee, three cups of coffee, four cups of coffee, five cups of coffee, because you're tired, you want momentum, you're living in the now, you're short-sighted, and you know that you'll be up too late and that you're going to ruin your sleep and tomorrow's going to be really hard. But because you don't have mindfulness or bodhicitta mindfulness, you just to hell with it. I'm tired right now. More coffee. Right. So bodhicitta mindfulness just keeps you awake to yourself with the big picture. So you're developing concentration and you're also developing altruism. And then, you know, everything you do in your life becomes through the filter of bodhicitta of, is this in alignment with my path to enlightenment or am I just fooling myself? And even those times you choose to fool yourself, you know that you are. And that starts to ruin the momentum of the lies we tell ourselves. Yeah. Like you're reading a novel at night and you think, I'm just going to read one more chapter. And then your bodhicitta mindfulness is like, no, you're not. You're going to read the whole book. I know you, right? But then the bodhicitta mindfulness might also say, oi, oi, hey, 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 right? Greater good, like tomorrow you need to be of benefit to sentient beings just like today. It's in everyone's best interest that you get enough sleep. Put it down. (laughs) <laughs> right and you may or may not right but at least your eyes wide open which starts to interrupt the momentum of negative habits you know if you do your most negative habits but with your eyes wide open sometimes you embarrass yourself and they run out of steam you know what i mean yes i do i do i my fa- my new favorite mantra is if i'm out of bodhicitta mindfulness mindfulness and it's strong production i go be like wood yeah right yeah just hold still (laughs) at least i can just stop and do nothing you know rather than continue down the rabbit hole of my own self-interest you know and it doesn't always work but at least i hear that sometimes and it works sometimes and then i pull back and i reassess and then then insights comes bodhicitta comes compassion and empathy takes about a day by the next day it's a whole different landscape but if i hadn't stopped no yeah Yeah, then you ruin your whole week crash and it's it's that thing too of like when you're in a mood 
and you're not believing the mood. That's kind of bodhicitta mindfulness saving you from yourself or saving you from your own worst habits. Without bodhicitta mindfulness, you get into a mood and then you just believe it and fall into it and are invested in it and are defensive about it and like no one can talk to you, <laughs> you know? And, you know, I was thinking about once I was, I was fully grumpy. I was like invested in my grumpiness, like fully committed to the grumpiness. And I had just a tiny window of like mindfulness that was like, you're being ridiculous. And I'm like, I know I'm <laughs> ridiculous, but I'm very grumpy. And, you know, it's one of those days where I'd like been prayers and class and cleaning and jobs and chores. And like, you know, it was one of those like 6 a.m. starts, you know, to like the public aspect. And then I was finally in the last part of the day, like 10 o'clock at night scrubbing something. And one of the other nuns came in and she was like, and she's from the South. She was like, Yin Tan, you look real grumpy. It cracked me up because it was like, she just held up a mirror to my like sulky face. And I was like, I just burst out laughing and I realized how ridiculous I was, but like my, my mindfulness wasn't quite strong enough to pull me out of it, (laughs) but it was strong enough to not be defensive. And I counted that as a win, right? (laughs) Cause years prior, I would have been like, shut up. No, I'm not. I'm just overworked. (laughs) Right. So, you know, so this is the thing is that I think this bodhicitta mindfulness, especially if you're used to a conversation about emptiness with yourself, then it means whatever you notice, you're not identifying with, but you're taking full responsibility for. And then you really can laugh at yourself. You're like, well, that's absurd that I do that. I've been doing this the whole time. If I were to tell my friends, they'd be like, yeah, we know, you know. But like bodhicitta mindfulness plus a bit of emptiness goes, well, I should stop then, you know, whereas without that, you think, oh, but it's me, I have to defend it. And I have to justify it and excuse it. And maybe if I feel bad about it, I'm allowed to keep it. You know, and we get so weird and toxic internally. So that's anyway, that's how you keep the inner guru awake. Mindfulness plus, right? Not passive mindfulness. Yeah, other thoughts? Coming clear? Okay, should we take a five minute break and then uh, do a little bit about the mantra and a little bit of practice? Okay, so a bit on the mantra and then we shall sit. So this is from that really amazing website some of you might know about called Lotsawa House, which has amazing short teachings and a lot of really good translations of the main texts and prayers available for free. So it's an awesome website if you don't know about it, Lotsawa House down the bottom. But basically the mantra means wisdom. (laughs) Okay, so Om is always going to mean enlightened body, speech, and mind except in the rare case that it's specifically emphasizing enlightened body. But in mantras, it always means enlightened body, speech, and mind. And ah, in this context, is the door to insight because of natural purity. Ra, the door to insight without stains. Pa, door to insight expounded ultimately. And za, door to insight that is unfathomable. Na, a door to insight of mere name, and then D, the seed syllable encompassing all. So you see here references to the bodies of the Buddha, particularly the wisdom bodies. There's references to that. And what we're really doing too is engaging the different parts of the mind that can hold different kinds of content whether experiential content or wisdom content that's more in the kind of knowledge and intelligence conceptual realm, but all of the things that are gonna lead to cutting through ignorance of all types, regular ignorance, ignorance about inherent existence, as well as just ignorance about karma or how to be a kind person or, you know, math or whatever. It's gonna help with all forms of cutting through ignorance and support all forms of knowledge. So D is the seed syllable, and you'll notice a lot of mantra garlands have the mantra around the edge in a circle, and then in the center is a seed syllable. And those kind of mantra garland depictions are flat representations of what is actually three-dimensional. 
So those mantras are standing upright, usually clockwise, but not always. We've got mother tantra, father tantra issues, but uh, that's another conversation. And in the center is something, right? So a seed syllable um, in tantric visualizations, a seed syllable is a Sanskrit syllable, usually the first syllable of the deity's name, which arises out of emptiness and from which the deity arises. It resides at the heart of the deity or guru, depending on the practice. And in standard guru yoga practices, the guru is the nirmanakaya, emanation body. The deity is the sambhogakaya, enjoyment body. And the seed syllable is the dharmakaya, truth body. And often those images are stacked or seen as kind of, you know, inseparable in some way. So also related to Manjushri are these seven wisdoms. And these are so interesting because I think they hit the nail on the head of what it is that we want. So in the book, it just says attainment such as great wisdom to comprehend and memorize both the meanings and the words of the extensive teachings, clear wisdom to be able to understand the subtle meanings of any subject, and quick wisdom to be able to immediately understand any difficult points and immediately eliminate wrong conceptions. These are some of the main ones, but there's seven of them. And so these great wisdom, clear wisdom, quick wisdom, profound wisdom, wisdom to explain, debating wisdom, writing wisdom, these aren't just about understanding emptiness, right? These are all different forms of wisdom. And it's very common before a class for a praise to Manjushri or the Manjushri mantra to be spoken to help you both understand and then retain what it is that you've learned. And I think that's our big issue as Dharma students is that we're kind of leaky pots, right? We've heard a lot of things many, many times, but you know, it sounds familiar, but we can't hold it. And the Manjushri mantra is surprisingly effective, even just in real time, like not like waiting for the result way down the track, but actually in the very moment of the class, if you just take a minute, Omarapatsana D, Omarapatsana D, Omarapatsana D, it can really help. It's surprising. So um, I recommend you experiment with it for all these different kinds of wisdoms. So these aren't explicitly listed in the chapter, but they are in the appendices at the back. So um, anything about the mantra Manjushri before we do the practice? Any kind of miss, this is going to be our only Manjushri day. Um, and then we're going to do Manjushri during the retreat, but not everyone's coming to the retreat. Yes, Nay, go ahead. You know, I have seen orange Manjushri and white Manjushri. And I often wondered, like, what is the difference? Yeah, and there's black Manjushri. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> black Manjushri. Right? Wow. So sometimes it's as simple as peace, increase, power, wrath with colors. Sometimes it's not so simple. Um, in the case of orange Manjushri, it is got that kind of um, yellow Ratnasambhava relationship with abundance and the wisdom of equanimity and um, helping overcome pride. But also Manjushri belongs to the Akshobhya Buddha family, which is about using the energy that accompanies anger to develop mirror-like wisdom. So often the deities will have kind of a dual Buddha family relationship. You know, like how Tara is green, but she belongs to the Amitabha Buddha family, red. So she has that Amoga City green swift side, but she also has the Amitabha Lotus family attachment uh, energy transforming side. Both. So often there's that. Um, white Manjushri is seen to be uh, one in nature with Lama Tsongkhapa. Black Manjushri is to really forcefully clear away obstacles when someone is aggressively acting out to harm you in a really in a particularly violent, violent or intentional way. So it's kind of about what's the thrust of it. Um, white Manjushri sometimes has a relationship with um, long life, I want to say, as well. There's um, some long life empowerments of white Manjushri. So like that. But um, when we say peace, increase, power, and wrath, these are qualities that all Buddhists have, but they emphasize one or the other. Or you can do their practice with the intention of, of yourself emphasizing one or the other. Yeah, oh, there's something in the chat, let's see. Um, excuse me, there's one that says Lama Tsongkhapa holds his sword on a flower, but Manjushri holds it directly. Is there 
some symbolism in this difference, um, probably, but I think probably a tonka painter would be the best one to give you clarification on that. And um, particularly Andy, Andy Weber, he knows all the random miscellaneous things about like, why slightly tilted this way? He knows all the things. Um, and then um, I've never heard how we're supposed to use emotions in Tantra. You just mentioned using anger with Manjushri. How would that work, for example? So when we're using negative emotions, we're not actually using negative emotions. We're using the energy that accompanies negative emotions. And that distinction is very important. Negative emotion can't become a positive emotion. They're discordant. They're of different types. Anger and love cannot exist in the same mental continuum at the same time. And you think, what about when I'm arguing with someone I love? Well, you alternate. You love them for a minute, you hate them for a moment, and it goes back and forth, back and forth. I want to help you, I want to hurt you. I want to help you, I want to hurt you. I will show you my displeasure with my angry face. Oh, actually, I do care about you. I will try and use soothing words. And it alternates and flickers. You actually don't love someone at the same time that you're angry with them. It goes back and forth. Okay. So when we say utilizing negative states of mind or utilizing negative emotions in Tantra, we don't mean that we're making something negative into something positive. We're looking at that raw energy that's kind of neutral. Okay. So I'll send you something about the five Buddha families. We don't really have time for it in this course. Um, a lot of you have heard this teaching before, but what we're talking about is take something elemental like water. Water is not necessarily good or bad in and of itself in its kind of elemental state, but when it's uh, boiling, it distorts and it doesn't reflect clearly. When it's still, it reflects perfectly. So imagine that this is analogous of, or maybe a metaphor for anger and mirror-like wisdom. So it's just water, right? Or it's just like, you know, something neutral. But when it's clear and unafflicted, you can see things very clearly and precisely with amazing intelligence. And when it's distorted, like with anger, it's, you know, all the bubbles are showing things in an incorrect, distorted way. So that raw kind of just waterness could go two ways. And what we're saying with Tantra is we're not trying to get rid of the water. We're trying to make it go to the wisdom side, not the afflicted side. And that every energy within us, every energy within us has the potential to go bad or to go productive. And so we don't have to fundamentally take anything out of us. We want to use what's within us in the correct way and develop different habit patterns going in that direction. So when you're very, very angry, for example, think of how much you have to say to yourself right? You have so much to say to yourself when you're angry, right? You have a list of why you're right and they're wrong. And you have a list of how dare they and what that tells you about humanity and people in general, or that specific group of people that they represent or whatever it is, you have so much to say to yourself. And what if the power of saying so many elaborate, complicated, creative things to yourself was used for good, right? That would be like intelligence, right? That would be like creative thinking. That would be um, interesting problem solving. That would be something very useful in your life. But right now, anger has co-opted that ability and taken it for its own. And you're using your powers of intelligence against yourself. Yeah, but you can see how they're kind of two sides of the same coin. So at this level of our Tantra discussion, the way in which to utilize those energies, um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail about. What you do is you just say, okay, I would like more wisdom, less anger. I'll practice Manjushri and see what happens. And the mantra itself helps click things to the correct direction. The mantra itself, the visualization itself. And it helps if you've done a lot of sutra study about anger is unjustified for all of these reasons. The antidote to, to anger is patience, loving kindness, the wisdom realizing emptiness, all the good stuff. You know that, but when you're doing the tantric practice, you don't actually have to go through all that analysis. Just do the practice with an open, clear mind and see what happens. Yeah, because it's a more energetic quality that we're working with. It's a less analytical quality that we're working with in tantra. 
but it helps to have done analysis prior because it gives more enthusiasm and oomph to actually going with it. So that might not be the most satisfying answer, but it's I think it's worth just experimenting with these very simple practices to do them by yourself at some point in a really heartfelt way without expectations and just kind of see what happens. And then if once you get higher yoga tantra um, empowerments, then seek out classes of that type to really get into the nitty gritty of how to more proactively work with those things. So the shifting of energies can be accomplished with Kriya Tantra was one question. Yeah, it can. It's levels, basically. So at Kriya Tantra, you're utilizing the level of kind of energy related to just kind of having seen something that usually is a catalyst for a negative state of mind. So the level of seeing a difficult person or the level of seeing someone you're attached to that amount of reactivity energy, you're trying to take the affliction away, keep the power of it and add a positive state of mind too. But the mechanisms of that don't need to be something you sit and fabricate, just do the practice and that helps it happen. Yeah, so it's the level of seeing is what we're using in Kriya Tantra. And then the different levels of Tantra get closer and closer to the objects that are a condition for negative states of mind to arise. Yeah, until it gets into very close proximity and very difficult, um, hard to work with levels of negative states of mind, which usually we're just sucked into our old habits with, which is why you need such strong renunciation, such strong bodhicitta, such strong correct view to practice highest yoga tantra. Yeah, otherwise you just kind of get closer and closer to the object, your anger or attachment or ignorance and just fall into your same old habits. And what was supposed to be medicine turns back into poison. So gently, gently. Okay. Um, any other questions before we do the practice? Okay. Meditation. <clears throat> so nice straight back. Settle into the space. Be really aware of your body. And just invite it to relax for a minute. And just start to really be aware of your breath. And start to bring in the idea that all sentient beings are seated around you. And for this meditation, imagine that all sentient beings are in human form, even though that's not the case in reality. It has been in the past, it will be in the future. And in this form, it's easier to relate. And so just sit and breathe and be aware of all sentient beings with you doing this practice together. And then visualize Manjushri in the space in front of you, facing you. Thinking that he's observing you with kindness and strong wisdom, while at the same time aware of all sentient beings. And if the details aren't clear, you can have a general impression of orange, the most important part being Manjushri, the embodiment of wisdom, is here.
And with that awareness, add refuge. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my practice of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And repeating those back to yourself, connecting with love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of all others to the great enlightenment. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Yadam Guru Ratna Mandala And revive the Manjushri visualization. You can have a look at the image and then close your eyes, bringing it to your mind's eye. One in nature with all of your root gurus, representing your own potential. And then visualize the syllable D at the center of Manjushri's heart. Light radiates out and invokes from their natural abodes, Arya Manjushri surrounded by the assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The light from the Manjushri in front, inviting all of the enlightened minds in the aspect of Manjushri. Who dissolve into him. And we offer praise. I prostrate to Manjushri, who possesses the holy body of youth, who radiates the lamp of wisdom, and who dispels the darkness of the three worlds. On top of a moon cushion at Manjushri's heart, there appears a yellow wheel with six spokes. At the central hub is a syllable D, and on the spokes are the six syllables of the root mantra. On the wheel's rim is the mantra of increasing wisdom. Light radiates from the mantras, pouring into you and all sentient beings surrounding you, dispelling the darkness of ignorance of yourself and others. It then hooks back all the wisdom of samsara and nirvana, 
which dissolves into you and other beings. So just stabilize that visualization for a moment and then we'll add the mantra to it. And we'll do the mantra of increasing wisdom once and then the root mantra several times. Namo Manjushreya Kumara Bhutaya Bodhisattvaya Mahasattvaya Mahakarunikaya Tayata Om Araje Biraje Shude Vishode Shodaya Vishodaya Amale Bimale Nirmale Jaya Vara Rujale Hum 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 Pe 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 Soha Om Narapatsanadi Om Narapatsa Nahadi 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 And continue the mantra under your breath together with the visualization of the orange light coming in dispelling all delusions all ignorance all suffering and then hooking all of the wisdom and knowledge of all the enlightened beings. Orange light flooding into you and all sentient beings. Om Arapatsana Di Om Arapatsana. Om We make offerings to Manjushri. Om Sawatata Gata Arya Manjushri Sapari Vare Aigyam Padyam Pure Pay Du Pay Aloke Gande Nu De Prati Sai Soha. Om Sawatata Gata Arya Manjushri Sapari Vara Shapta Ahum Soha. I prostrate to Manjushri, who possesses the holy body of youth, who radiates the lamp of wisdom, and who dispels the darkness of the three worlds. Om Vajrasattva Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasattva Deno Bhadishta Dido Mebhava Sudokaya Mebhava Supokaya Mebhava Anarakta Mebhava Sawa Siddhi Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutsa Me Siddham Shriyam Guru Hum Ahahaha Ho Bhagavan Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mame Mutsa Vajra Bawa Mahasamaya Sapa Ahum Pe. And visualize on the root of your tongue is the syllable D, either in Tibetan, Sanskrit, or English, or whatever your language of choice that represents that sound. The top of it is facing down towards your windpipe. And while holding that visualization, we recite D 108 times in one breath and visualize that the whole body turns into the syllable D. 
And as you re repeat the D, imagine Mandrew three in front of you and his wisdom in the form of a flaming syllable D like a blazing fire. This comes from Manju Shri and absorbs into a similar D visualized at the back of your tongue. From this wisdom flames arise, eliminating the darkness of ignorance. You can imagine the flame filling your whole body, fully developing your wisdom. And you imagine all your pores completely fused with the syllable D, causing you to attain non-forgetfulness. So you can hold these ideas in your mind, but just generally think that orange nectar light, the essence of wisdom, goes down your throat and drops to your heart chakra and eventually fills you up completely. And this stabilizes and increases your wisdom. So filling up with orange light as many times as you can on one breath. Oma Rapatsana di 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 Imagine that you swallow the D down to your heart center and achieve the Durrani of non-forgetfulness. And we dedicate. Imagine that Manjushri dissolves and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. Due to these merits, may I quickly attain the state of Arya Manjushri and place all migrating beings without exception in that very state. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And so this is an optional extra that we don't have time for today, but we can add the Lama Sunkapa Guru Yoga to Manjushri practices. So it's basically Lama Sunkapa, one in nature with Manjushri, sends a tube of white light to your crown and flushes you clean. And then you really stabilize that all of these are one in nature. And then you say the five line prayer, which a lot of you know, me may say we teach in Chenrezig. And you hold that while adding the prayer for the wisdoms. So you have great understanding, etc. So each one has their own visualization. That's kind of a nice extra if you feel like it, but it's fine just as it is without the seven wisdoms as well. If you're not here for the retreat, no worries. I'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, everyone.